welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast at the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Immigration is once again a contentious issue. 90% of Australians think population growth should be stopped because of the impact on housing affordability, congestion and overcrowding. But Australia's success is as much a story of migration as it is about our values of tolerance, pluralism and liberalism. Joining me to discuss the history of migration and social cohesion in Australia is sociologist Dr Catherine Betts. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Catherine. Thank you, Georgina. It's lovely to have you here in the old quad at Melbourne University and such a topical issue that is dominating the headlines once again. I think back to the late 90s when immigration was such a a palpable issue. It was creating political movements in the form of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, of course, and then it died away. But immigration is once again coming to the fore and people are concerned about its impacts. But the broader point, I guess, is around social cohesion. Why is social cohesion so important to Australia? Well, it's very important for persuading Australians who are reasonably comfortably off to support those who are struggling unless you have a sense that we're all part of this big national family, you're not really going to get that kind of sentiment that says, well, the poorest of the poor, that could be my grandson, it could be my neighbour. These are all Australians and it's disgraceful that we live in a country as comfortable and well-off as this and that some people are struggling. So you do need this sense of a team spirit so that people who are in danger of being left behind can be given that little bit of a lift along. And then, of course, there are collective things that we need to do, preserving the environment. If you don't care a hoot about Australia, this is just a resource to be used up and I'll move on somewhere else if it becomes nasty. Well, that's not going to be a way to help the whole collection of us to thrive and for our children and our grandchildren to be happy and secure in this country. So countries without a sense of cohesion, you can think of some third world places where there's tribal infighting, and there's no sense of a common we, that we must do something about this problem. We might say that it's terrible that Aborigines are living in such dire conditions. We should do something about this. We're all Australians, and it's really disgraceful that a group of us are being left to endure such hardships. It, no, it's a fascinating point because we would take it pretty much for granted that we have a really high degree of social cohesion in Australia and we have that sense of responsibility for the broader whole, for that sense of community and care for physical environment as well. But, I mean, how unique are we in the world? Is this something that's really hard fought to build a cohesive country like Australia or is it something that just develops with the level of affluence and we're not so unique after all? I think it depends on how much peace and stability you've been able to support in your country. There's this this sense, this we feeling, means that we can talk about we, the people of Australia. If you lived somewhere where there was no sense of national belonging, you might think we, the supporters of this particular football team, or we, the supporters of this particular faith. But to be able to say we, and to mean all Australians, when we say we should do something about this, there's a sense that we know what we're talking about. And I think that most mature democracies have that feeling. And indeed, the idea of a team spirit, it goes back to the tribalism that our remote ancestors would have had, which was important for protecting the interests of that particular group. And the miraculous thing is that somehow or other, many modern nations have been able to extend that, you know, the quite warm interpersonal thing where you know the people involved and you know the history, to a huge community of strangers. But we can still say that we should be doing something about East Timor. We should be doing something about the Aborigines. And we all know who we're talking about. We're not talking about just people who live in my suburb of Melbourne. We in my suburb of Melbourne should do something about the local park. That's different. But there's not the same feeling of emotional commitment, I think. And, of course, in a country like Australia where population is changing with migrant flows and so who is an Australian is very different to 20 years ago, to 50 years ago, to 100 years ago, to let alone 300 years ago. That idea of we has to evolve with the changing face of Australia, doesn't it? And that must be a challenge. Well, it is a challenge, but it is happening. Because in our recent survey, this is done through the Australian Population Research Institute, 
which is our sixth national survey of voters, we asked a question, to what extent do you feel a sense of belonging to Australia? And the options were to a great extent, to a moderate extent, not very much and not at all. About 10% were not very much or not at all. 47% were to a great extent. And that was similar for overseas-born people from English-speaking background countries and overseas-born people from Europe. Indeed, some of them had it to a slightly greater extent than for the Australian-born. And I think that's a factor of having lived a long... Many of them living, having lived a long time in Australia because the great waves of immigration from Britain and from southern Europe and so forth, they're, they're not the main strands of immigration now. And quite understandably, people from Asia and the Middle East didn't have that sense of belonging. They haven't been here so long. And it's something that grows with custom and integrating and finding your feet in the new country. And I'm sure that individual people of migrant background can talk about horrible stories of people being nasty to them at school or in the street. But by and large and over the long term, those sorts of occasional unpleasantnesses, I hope they're only occasional, evaporate because people are feeling at home in the place. But they're often very strong patriots and say how happy they are to be in this country. And people love them for saying that. So it is a question of time and a question of having reasonable experiences here mm. because most of the early waves of post-Second World War migrants were able to find reasonable jobs, able to buy their own house, able to educate their children, in many cases send them off to university, something that they might not have been able to do if they stayed from wherever. So I think it's understandable. This is what integration is about. Yeah. It takes time. Mm. It's a fascinating observation through your research that the length of time is what gives you that sense of belonging and mm. Australianness. And your ability to speak the language is so important. And yes. we've had debates in Australia around whether migrants should come here already speak English or whether they should be supported to speak English and that you know, how to support integration. And some people are pretty dismissive that it's your job to sort all that out and Australian taxpayers shouldn't have to fund it. But actually, that's an investment in social cohesion. Absolutely. Yes, and it's very hard to learn a foreign language, especially to learn it so that you can be fluent. I mean, it's very, very taxing. And you can only have respect for people who manage. If they come here with no English, I have friends who have come here with no English and with very limited support are now doing pretty well with their English. And that's just excellent. Yeah. Uh, they're clever enough to bring their children up to speak both languages, which is wonderful for us as a country to have those resources. Yes, well, we haven't been so strong at the teaching of second languages, I think, <laughs> is my anecdotal mm. experience. So if we can at least import some fluent speakers, maybe that will give <laughs> us an advantage. The Menzies era is known for the very significant numbers of migrants yes. coming to Australia in the post-war period, of course particularly from Europe, and this is still a time of white Australia. So while that early 20th century we were having British and Irish migrants exclusively, mm. really, we then have this expansion to European migration in the mm. post-war era. Culturally, though, European migrants were quite different from the British-Irish migrants, and yet we don't see instances of a breakdown of social cohesion in any kind of systemic way, what do you think was the secret? What was the reason behind that rather smooth experience we had as a nation in the 50s and 60s? Well, I think one of the things was that most of the immigrants came from democracies or if they didn't, they really wanted to be in a democratic country. They were fleeing from totalitarianism. But we also, it's going to be sort of fashionable to mock at the Judeo-Christian background that we have, but many of our democratic institutions stem from that, so that even if you're a fire-breathing atheist, you were brought up in a culture that was formed by the Judeo-Christian ethos. Ideas of the separation of state and church, that's a vital kind of principle mm. to have. Yes, because the alternative is a theocracy. Indeed, right? so like, yes. you know, Some Islamic countries will have you know, yes. an ayatollah or some religious leader as the country's leader Indeed. and then there's a religious law that is applied to country yes. and so you are then 
under a kind of a system that can't be challenged because it's against the word of God. Yes, Whereas exactly. In a country like Australia, your religion is your private domain and the state then is the authority of the law of the land or the judiciary. And there's that sense of secularism which can be quite reassuring. Yes, it is. And if whatever the faith is involved runs the state, well then clearly God will want them to make sure everyone believes and conforms. I guess for a long time, say, in the history of Britain, that wasn't the case. If you didn't conform to the general religion, you were in deep trouble. But gradually, the nonconformists got to be allowed to be nonconformists. And during the 19th century, they were allowed to vote and go to university and all those important things. It is, I think, an important difference in the culture of the Western democracies. And of course, This separation of church and state means it's easier to have a democracy. I'm not saying having a democracy is easy. It's not. It's hard. And we think we can just charge into some country that's in trouble, knock out the bad guys and give everyone the vote and they'll be all right. It won't be all right because you won't have any apparatus of the state. You won't have a system. I'm taking it you're not a neoconservative then, Catherine. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. I don't think that markets will. Markets solve a number of problems, but they certainly don't solve all of our problems. Yes. And separation of church and state and the establishment of the rule of law, which is vital. And voting is terrific. How you get to then vote for people who can change the law. But don't be too premature. Don't hand out the votes before you've got the other things. (laughs) So the shared religious traditions and the shared political traditions of the migrants with the resident Australians was important in the 50s in terms of democracy and Christianity, irrespective Mm. of denomination. Obviously, there were Catholics and Mm -hmm. Orthodox and the like coming. And then, of course, the Jewish tradition as well, and that's a broader Judeo-Christian tradition. But were there economic factors that were important? Of course. I mean, this is the golden era of economic growth. I always repeat the amazing statistic. I think it's in 1958 in South Australia, there were only three people registered as unemployed. Good Lord, really? I didn't know that. And you just got to wonder, who were they? What on (laughs) earth were they doing? But, you know, you could get a job. You could buy a house. Housing affordability was decent and... There was a sense that if you wanted to get ahead in life, you could, irrespective of your creed or colour, basically. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. It was well, maybe your, your colour was mainly white, let's be honest. Yes, so yes. Maybe irrespective of your creed. Well, if you yeah. weren't white, then you were exotic and yeah. interesting. <laughs> yes, I guess so. <laughs> yes, there was this feeling of school leavers, say, in the late 1960s of what job will I deign to take? There's a number of them out there. Which would I enjoy the most? And as for wanting a house, why would you want to settle yourself with a house so young? It'll be easy when you really need it. Not that anyone articulated that, but that was the zeitgeist. And now it's just so dreadfully hard for young people. Yes. It's understandable that they can feel a little bit peeved off with what their country is doing for them. And that sense of economic insecurity then contributes to concerns around what's causing it and if it's too many people coming into the country then that contributes to a sense of well I'm not sure about this immigration thing anymore it's not really necessarily serving our best interests. Yes and I think this feeling of uneasiness can be intensified by the social taboo that it's really kind of nasty of you to talk about it Mm. that selfish racist people and Pauline Hanson is held up as an example of the kind of person you shouldn't be. And this is not helpful Mm. because we know from survey data that a lot of people have politically incorrect thoughts, but they don't feel that they're allowed to express them. And this can mean that there can be a bit of a simmering thing going on. I mean, it's not a healthy situation. We should be able to talk about demography, just as we talk about economics, in a sensible way, without hurling abuse at each other or even adopting the anxious frown of, is this person I'm talking to really not a nice person? I thought she was, and she's coming out with these terrible things. I'd better go away and tell other people how dreadful she is. (laughs) I guess there is this tension, though, between having what you say are politically incorrect thoughts around demography and not being an outright racist. I mean, categorising one group as lesser because of their race rather than their individual characteristics. And so, I mean, that is just a challenge in an open, pluralistic, tolerant society like Australia. 
And then you wonder, Catherine, what is the impact of that kind of the last vestiges of white Australia that hangs over the discourse when it comes to the issues of demography and immigration? Is that sensitivity around we need to be completely open to anyone and never criticise demographic changes for fear of being cast as an antediluvian white Australia policy <laughs> supporter? Well, I suppose there is some trace of that still, but many of us nowadays have friends who are recent migrants, friends who are not necessarily from the same ethnic background as ourselves, and we know that they are real human beings. I mean, this is really important, that people mix enough to have diverse friendship groups, sporting groups and so forth. And I think you can only really learn that Everybody else is a real human being with the same kind of thoughts and feelings as yourself by getting to know a wider spectrum of people. Of course, if you're obviously a different colour from the majority of the population, you stand out, and that may be uncomfortable. I don't know. I do remember that at the school I went to in Hobart, we had not many, but some pupils from Chinese origin, Indian origin, and they were treated as trophies. We were so fascinated by them and really wants to get to know them. Maybe it's a question of numbers, because such people are visible in the street, and memes about we're being swamped by this kind of ethnicity or that kind of ethnicity can spread. And if you feel that you don't have any say, that your whole neighbourhood is changing, and that you're evil if you object to this, never mind the fact that chances of your children being able to buy houses in the area where you live is zero, it does create social tensions. It does. So overdoing it, as has been happening lately, if you think from the Second World War up to the early 2000s, net overseas migration averaged around 90,000 a year. We're now looking at 550,000. Now that's absurd. It's ridiculous. What's happened is the current government has just left the door open. We don't have a cap on temporary migrants. In the United States, they do. Now, I'm not saying we should hold the United States up as a model of how to do things because they've got this terrible problem of illegal immigration people crossing from the border with Mexico, which we don't have. But nonetheless, we don't put a cap on the the temporary entry, so it turns out that if you've got the right credentials, you're in. And the government is trying to do something to slow this down by tightening up on the sorts of credentials and also slowing up the processing of visas. It's a bureaucratic kind of fudge. But so far, they haven't had much success. In the month of February alone, net overseas migration was 100,000. That's more than the annual average for the the post-war period. Yes, it's amazing, the increase. I wondered if you could reflect, though, on how unusual Australia is in sort of an international sense. So obviously, pre-white settlement of Australia in the late 19th century, we had 300 or so thousand Indigenous people inhabiting this enormous continent. Mm. And then it was this gradual and then sometimes in periods like the Gold Rush, quite sharp increase of white migration, Mm. predominantly British and Irish migration to Australia. So there was a sense that everyone was, aside from the 300,000 Indigenous Australians, everyone was a new migrant. So that kind of attitude that Australia is a migrant country, like the United States, like Canada, we're pretty accustomed to that. But not every country is like that. I mean, there's a lot of European countries are not like that, African countries, Asian countries. I lived in Japan for four years, almost have no migration whatsoever. Mm. And you're a gaijin, a foreigner, is a curiosity. Yes. And, <laughs> and so there's no you, real prospect of ever becoming Japanese. Were you treated as an yes. interesting curiosity? Yes. <laughs> you yes. weren't shunned in the street. No, no, <laughs> no, that's right. Yes. yes. And of course, Europe is now finding out what it's like to have a lot of immigrants from different kinds of backgrounds, and they're not particularly happy about it. I think that the fact that almost all of us either we ourselves came from elsewhere or our parents or grandparents did. It does help. It does help. But nonetheless, the intake needs to be managed in such a way that people can cope with it and that it doesn't become something that has people up in arms and thinking the government simply doesn't care about us. They doesn't care about the cost of living. They don't care about the fact that we're under stress. They just left the door open. Why is it that critiques of immigration 
tend to be, I mean, you've explained that they tend to be considered politically incorrect and sort of unacceptable and you're not a nice person if you criticise immigration. You Mm. should be completely open to anyone, it seems. But it's often pointed as a criticism of the far right. You're you're a far right person if you criticise immigration. What is that about, Catherine? Well, I'm not sure what the far left and the far right are. I suppose the far left is when you become a communist. I was a communist at school. They called me Commo Kate. <laughs> nice alliterative quality yes. there. However, over the years I have changed to the moderate centre. <laughs> okay. A far right person, you could say that someone who believed that market liberalism was the way to solve all our problems and we didn't need anything else, I would call that far extreme right. But I think what people have in mind is jackbooted types doing Nazi salutes, and that's disgusting and horrible. It is, with that image, it's something you don't want anyone to say, oh, she's on the far right. I was at a seminar last night, very good speaker, talking about climate change and how to do something about it, and everyone was right on about this. Nobody was saying, I don't really think it's such a big problem. I'm not sure where I stand on all of that. I mean, I'm going with the flow on climate change. But I was thinking, this group of about 20 people, if you were to say, well, I think population growth is a frightful problem, you wouldn't get the same right-on response, not at all. Right. You'd get an awkward silence. <laughs> because it's considered not, socially not, unacceptable yes, to yes, criticise yes. it. And in your research, the issue is that actually there are a lot of people in Australia who do have these politically incorrect views. People like Geoffrey Blaney, who, the very eminent historian Indeed. who was an academic yeah, professor here at Melbourne University mm. and really lost his job he for was. identifying that there were Australians who were concerned about migration. He wasn't from, even saying that he was. He was just no, saying there, Australians were. there were some Australians who yes. were concerned about Asian migration and that really, really crueled his career for some time. Early yes. victim of cancel culture. Yes. Yes, yeah, so... I think that we have learned through those experiences that you tread very carefully. I do remember Professor Blaney saying that he'd made much the same statements at a talk he'd done at Warrnambool or somewhere. No, what the, the Warrnambool was the one that brought him unstuck, but it was a talk that he'd done in some remote place. The journalists had been there and it was ignored. It's just it's something picked up. Somebody, oh, that's a terrible thing. Maybe I could run with this in my newspaper or my radio program or whatever. And the disease catches I think it's probably still very wise to be, to be cautious. But it then, I guess, doesn't do justice to the genuine concerns held yes. by quite a large number of Australians who as citizens have an expectation of certain provision of services for the collective, mm. for the we that we were talking about earlier. Well, in our survey, 73% of voters wanted lower immigration. Yes. 49% wanted drastic cuts or none. Right. And we had a question, we'd done a survey in 2022, does Australia need more people? And then 65% said no. This time, the survey was in the field in December last year, 71% said no. Mm. But there's no one for them to vote for. Tell me about that. So we've been here before, of course, through the Hawke government, the immigration policies that were adopted through that time and cultural policies as well ended up resulting in quite a bit of negative sentiment towards immigration. Mm. What was it about those policies in that era that I guess was so different from, say, the Menzies era when we had large numbers of people coming to Australia but there wasn't the groundswell of opinion against migration? Bob Hawke was a, a very keen promoter of the idea of multiculturalism. We had multiculturalism centres. And Can you explain what that means? I mean, I <laughs> think I know what it means. And it was a, a credo of the 80s, wasn't it? I was born in 1979. So, oh, so you, can you grew all, up you with can, it. You can all work out my age. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> but it was accepted. Yes. The accepted wisdom. We are a multicultural country and it's inherently a good thing. Yes. Well, what it meant, well, we should value these different cultures that we have in our midst. You don't have to go to Greece to find Greek people. You can find them here and Greek restaurants and all sorts of Greek things happening, and likewise with the Italians. And this is an excellent thing. And that's what the broader community got. But for the migrant groups themselves, there was a sense that, oh, look, it's pretty good to get organised here. There'll be multicultural funding for X, Y and Z. But the sort of the feeling began to grow. 
that everyone has got an important and meaningful rich culture, except the poor old Anglo-Australians who are just out there in the boondocks being crudos. And what the research, again, this is something you didn't really talk about, but once you get a private opinion poll, the research was really building up in the late 80s and the early 90s that people were sick of it and they didn't like it. And so when John Howard came in, he talked about harmony rather than about multiculturalism. And bodies like FECA, the Federation of Ethnic Community Councils of Australia, that had been an important body that Hawke would go to for advice and so on. FECA is still around, but you don't hear about it in the news. And yes, I think that people, the majority of the population, were thinking, well, don't we have a culture? Aren't we important? And the rise of the mighty ethnic was what somebody or other <laughs> put it <laughs> as. It was, it was all interesting, but I think it's much better to be talking about harmony rather than saying we are this wonderful kaleidoscope of different ethnic groups who all have their own culture and their own identity. Any of the children grew up just wanting to be Australian, and indeed lots of the adults weren't really into it. I mean, I reflect on that song that Qantas uses in its ag campaigns, we are one, yes. but we are many, from all the lands oh, we come. Yes, but in, in the end, I am, you are, we are Australia. Yes, absolutely. That overarching sentiment, you can come from mm. whatever land you are, yes. you come from, but ultimately there is a sense of Australianness, Australian mm. identity. In the 70s, with the election of the Whitlam government in 72, and he was launched the Multicultural Australia policy, yes. It was a real rejection of we are one, we are many, mm. but we're all Australian. Was it a backlash to the 22 long years of Liberal governments and we want to do something completely different? What was it about Probably Australian about. identity that needed to be discarded and diversity and multicultural and difference needed mm. to be celebrated and put on a platform? Well, as you would on certain the demise of the White Australia policy was happening gradually during conservative governments, but Whitlam destroyed any remnants of it with a great flourish, so most people think it was he who abolished the White Australia policy. Interestingly, he was not a high immigration man, not at all. But, yeah, I think, you know, it's time for a change. This is all different. An emphasis on multiculturalism and an enthusiasm for the ethnic communities was all part of it. And I don't think that people minded very much. It was just as it went on and on and on. And it seemed almost as if we are one bit was being forgotten and the we are many, many yeah. was not. And yet, you know, where does someone of an Anglo-Australian background or an old Australian background who's so mixed up in their ancestry, there's no point in identifying with Serbia or whatever, where, where do we fit? And of course, there's far more of that kind of we people than there are of the members of ethnic communities who want to keep on staying ethnic forever and ever. What did you think was the turning point when public opinion turned against that idea of multicultural Australia and wanted to reassert a sense of we are one, we are Australian? Well, it's pretty hard to pick up from the survey data before around about 1988. But by then, Office of Multicultural Affairs, big survey, showed that they were not really the most popular body on earth. <laughs> so a lot of it was probably happening underground for yes. a long, long time. I mean, my memories of 1988 as an eight-year-old through that yeah. year was, of course, the bicentenary celebrations, which were yes. a celebration of British settlement of Australia. Yes. I mean, it's quite a – you can't imagine – the parades and the mm. Sydney Harbour and with, filled with tall ships like it was then yes. now. I mean, it seems completely out of step with current trends yes. in national celebrations. But that was happening in 1988, mm. while at the same time there was a distancing from that part of our nation's story yes. and identity. That didn't mean that people were unhappy with the migrants who were here. They just didn't like the idea of ethnicity being institutionalised, I suppose. Mm. And the election of the Howard government in 1996, mm. I mean, they were elected on a platform of many things, but there was a, quite an important piece around reforms they wanted to introduce to immigration yes. policy to address that groundswell yes. of opinion against the Hawke era multicultural mm. policies. How did that work and did it work? It did work. 
the Howard government did all sorts of things and put on behind the scenes to tighten up the program. You couldn't bring in more than two spouses, and there had to be a five years gap between. More than two spouses? So well, I know that were time for you to bring in a spouse. I said, no, that didn't work out. I'm getting divorced. <laughs> I see. And then you had to wait five years before you could bring in another one, and that was it, that you'd used up your quota of spouses. Did the first spouse have to return home? Not usually, no. No, okay. Perhaps, right. you, might, perhaps you might want to, but probably <laughs> people bringing in up to five in a series. It was a nice little racket. So that sort of thing they really tightened up on. And then, of course, they cut the intake from about 96,000 to 86,000, which was not chopping it off at the knees, but it was a cut. And the people who profit from immigration fuel population growth went bananas. Immigration slashed, was headlines all over the place. So you'd have to be living under a rock not to know that had happened. And who were those people who were benefiting from Immigration. I mean, obviously, migration agents would have benefited, but yes. in the because this is often a complaint you see about if the government were to crack down on migrant numbers, mm. that there would be serious economic consequences. We have a labour shortage here. We need migrant labour. We've been having a shortage of skills since the 1970s. I can document that. We must bring in more migrants, skilled migrants, of course, because we're short of skills. Well, are we so dopey that we can't train people here? It's just ridiculous. It's an ongoing excuse that's been going for over 50 years, and it's time people stopped, (laughs) that we did something about local training. Yes, but the people who profit from immigration fuel, population growth, our land developers, they love it. And, of course, people who want cheaper labour for low-skilled jobs, so they're really happy. In our survey, one of the things that we had, do you or you and a partner own the house in which you live, etc.? And then do you or you and a partner own investment property? Does Australia need more people? The only people who were ambivalent about this were those who owned an investment property. It was quite, look, I was sad to see it in a way, but there is a little subgroup where 49% of them say, yes, Australia does need more people, whereas the other... When you subtract 71 from 100, what you get, you get 29%. So that's interesting. But it's the cheaper labour and the property developers. But it's not just them. It's only in the last decade or so that I have become aware of the role that Treasury plays in this. Mm. Treasury is very keen on immigration because migrants pay income tax. And income tax is one of their main sources of revenue. And the states have to pick up the cost of infrastructure. Nonetheless, the states haven't been complaining. But nonetheless, New South Wales and Victoria, because Sydney and Melbourne collect a lion's share of the migrant intake, are heavily in debt because of all the infrastructure building. So, yes, Treasury, look, this is fourth hand. I can't vouch for it. But I was told that somebody who was a minister in Cabinet brought up the question, we really need to cut immigration back. And the Treasurer said, you top up the money that we lose then Mm. because Mm. they were just concerned they were going to lose the income tax money. And so I hadn't really realised what a strong friend the growth lobby has within government. Yes, well, we've been in a per capita recession for quite some time. Four quarters, four quarters of per capita recession. Yeah, yeah, and of course immigration does hide that. But it, it seems as you're talking to me that economics is everything here. So as economic conditions go up and down, our concern with something to blame, and often it's immigration, and that might be for very good reasons, Mm. ebbs and flows as well. When we're concerned about welfare payments going to someone's fifth wife (laughs) they brought in from overseas, then we're going to be concerned about that when we don't have a job or we're worried about government debt and high Mm. interest rates and we can't afford a house because the housing developers are jacking up the prices of all the new builds because of all new people coming in Mm. who need somewhere to live and we can't rent a house because the competition for apartments is so high because of all these new people coming in. So in the end, it seems less cultural despite the experiences of the 80s where Australian culture was diminished in relation to the multicultural ethnic cultures being sort of uplifted. Mm. But really there's a very strong economic strand of trend here when it comes to individual concern around migration. Yes, I think it is that if you and your family are doing okay, to know 100,000 migrants, well, you know, I seem to be all right. Uh, Numbers, I'm not 
good with numbers, and it doesn't register. But I think huge numbers, like over half a million in one year, does register, especially in a time of economic stress. And we are lucky that we don't have the illegal problem that most other countries that are not islands do have. We did, and the unfortunate episodes with the boat people and so forth, it was really very distressing all round. But people were really agitated about that. And I think this feeling of people coming in uninvited into our country and you're being told you're a bad anti-humanitarian racist person for objecting, that really did upset people. But as long as immigration seems to be orderly and seems to be controlled, in good economic times, people don't make a fuss about it. Yeah, so it's having faith and I guess that Australian sense of fairness, faith in a fair system, Mm. that if you're in a queue, you take your place and you wait your time and when you're at the front of the queue, you can be assessed and if you get in, you get in and if you don't, you don't. But that sense of if it's unfair, if it's out of control, I'm scared of this. I don't want to. The theme of control is really interesting. If you go back and look at the immigration debates in Parliament in the 70s and the 80s, The theme was always, we're in control. We can't accept these people or those people. This is a controlled system. Whereas I've been amazed that in the last year or so, government spokesmen saying, well, it's not our fault. We we didn't do it. I think, hang on, where's this theme of control that's meant to reassure the general public so much? You seem to have sort of ditched that and say, well, you know, the door was open and they came in and we didn't really intend that to happen. It's not our fault. Yes. yes. (laughs) Well, when you're speaking of control, I just was reminded of, of course, the Brexit campaign in the UK where the Brexit side, were one of their slogans was take back control. Take back control of our borders, of our finances, of our laws. That idea of control, well, it gives people some sense of, reassurance yes. that's what a nation state yes. is meant to do yes. it's meant to be able to control things within the realms of human possibility yes it can't control the weather but it can control who comes across the borders <laughs> so you obviously receive a great many insights from your australian population research institute surveys and the recent ones you were conducting were of course around the time of the voice referendum yes. last year which was held in october last year and That referendum, while asking a particular question about the recognition of Indigenous people in our constitution Mm -hmm. through an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, also touches on that idea of national unity and identity and equality too. Were there sentiments expressed in your surveys that touched on the importance of those issues or lack of importance and how divided Australia is on those issues? Well, first of all, we asked whether they voted. I know voting is compulsory in Australia, but not everybody did. Well, I always say attendance at the poll, <laughs> either through a postal vote or yes. <laughs> or attending the poll physically is compulsory, but you don't actually have to vote. Well, you can always write something bizarre yes. on your And your having been a poll. scrutineer, I can tell you that people do. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, we began by saying, did you vote yes. or did something come up which prevented you from voting? Okay. We don't want people who didn't vote in inventing their answers. Okay, fair, <laughs> so fair, the, yeah. you only got to the next question of how did you vote after you've been screened for someone who actually did <laughs> yeah, vote. Well, indeed. And the people who voted no, who said they voted no, they got flicked through to another set of questions about possible reasons for voting no. And some of the press commentary after the vote was in and they realised that the yes case had been lost, they oh, well, people are too preoccupied about the cost of living crisis and thought that politicians should be focusing on that rather than on frills like this. Well, only 14% of people said that that the cost of living crisis was something that ought to have taken precedent. I don't have the actual numbers before me, but I think over 50% said something along the lines that we are one country, and another 20% said something similar, but I don't have the actual prompts. I have here that 53% of no voters said that they thought the proposed voice would undermine Australian solidarity, and then 14% said they should focus on cost of living. Yes. (laughs) Not the voice. (laughs) So you're very, very accurate, Catherine, yes. (laughs) So that sort of idea of fairness, of being together, of of the we, Mm. was Incredibly important for over 50% of the country who voted no. Yes. Mm. And that 
sense of belonging to a country too, mm. to Australia, as you were saying earlier yes. in our discussion. That's quite a strong sentiment by English-speaking long-term migrants. Mm. But it would be interesting to know what were the migrant community's views on the voice and its impact on solidarity? Was that something that came out in the research? Something that could be brought out, but I don't think I've brought it out, <laughs> that in the paper, the sense of belonging, as I said earlier, was yes. very strong amongst long-term migrants been here a long time. No, I could do that data for you, but I don't have it. <laughs> yes. The idea of a big Australia, which has been around for generations and it's occasionally a big debate, occasionally not at all in the media, mm. once again, it's sort of in the media, but it's probably not quite articulated as it once was. I remember growing up, people talking about a big Australia yes. and whether it was appropriate or not. Poor old Mr Rudd at some stage said he favoured a... A big Australia. But <laughs> Prime Ministers tend to have favoured a big Australia. I, I mean, I can't think, actually, of a Prime Minister, and you will be able to think of one, I'm sure, and some of the clever people listening to this podcast might, but I can't think off the top of my head of a Prime Minister who said, no, I want a small Australia. I mean, we have Prime Ministers who said we need to populate or perish. It's men, money, markets. We need more people yeah. to fill this wide brown land. And as you say, the Treasury boffins are saying, we need the revenue, the income tax <laughs> revenue, the universities here, and we're sitting on a university campus of 70,000 students. That is a really important part of their business, a foreign student yes. income. So Big Australia is part of the accepted wisdom of our country that is good for our country, but your survey show that people don't really like Big Australia. No, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> 71% say we do not need more people. Back in the 1990s, the Australian Academy of Science said that our carrying capacity was 23 million. Well, we've passed that. We're at 27 million. Yes, it is a wide brown land. Check the brown bit. It's not madly fertile. Grain harvest will feed 60 million, and that's great for the people overseas, but we grow and we're using all of it here. Our main exports are agricultural products and minerals. Now, that means that the national income that we earn from overseas trade is having to get shared with more and more people. I can understand how after World War II, when people were genuinely scared, it was understandable that... Boost the population, that will make us safer. But heaven's sake, wars nowadays are not so much a question of unfortunate boys behind guns. It's more a question of technology and national cohesion to want to think there's something here that's worth defending. The previous survey we asked, uh, this was when the Ukraine war was starting up, what would you do if Australia were threatened with invasion like the Ukraine? And the answers were, um, stay and fight, stay and help the fighters or leave Australia. About 17 said they would leave Australia. Where are they going? I don't know where they're going. <laughs> Antarctica? <laughs> yes. New Zealand? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it doesn't mean it was 30% of people who lived in Canberra. <laughs> it doesn't mean that bringing in lots of extra people means that they're going to have the will and the desire to make sacrifices for the country or that they might go back where they came from. Look, I um, wonder if we've hit peak big Australia. The current population pro projections are that we'll hit 38 million by 2050, which is in 26 years' time, so yes. not very long. And it does seem quite extraordinary. But, you know, we'll probably be speaking in 2050. Those projections were... <laughs> are always blasted out of the park, aren't no, they, by the reality? <laughs> their high projection for immigration was something in the 200,000 mark. It wasn't in the 500,000 no, mark. No, no, <laughs> indeed. So, look, fascinating to hear about the history, the survey results and what they reveal about Australian sentiments. Catherine, and thank you so much for sharing your research and thoughts with me today. Thank you for inviting me, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 